More than 50 Democratic members of the Texas House of Representatives have fled the Lone Star State in an effort to prevent the passage of an election reform bill. It's just the latest stunt from Democrats nationwide who seem intent on blocking any and all voter integrity measures. Friends, it's time for Hold the Line. But some things in America should be simple and straightforward. Perhaps the most important of those things, the most fundamental of those things, is the right to vote. The right to vote freely. The right to vote freely, the right, the right to vote fairly, the right to have your vote counted. Welcome to Hold the Line. I'm Buck Sexton. There you had Joe Biden today talking about what the Democrats are increasingly clear they view as a war on voting from Republicans, or a racist suppression of votes. That's what is underneath, or that's what's behind all of this. That's what they'll tell us. That's what they say. And that has led to some pretty extreme actions from some Democrats in Texas. Here we can show you 58 members of the Texas State House fleeing. That's one of the jets. Notice no masks. They're under FAA regulations on this plane too. No masks. Oh, it's almost like Democrats expect you to obey rules that they ignore because they're important and you're not. But here you have one of two flights and they went to DC, these Texas state representatives, 58 of them, so that they wouldn't be in a position to allow for a quorum where the Republicans can pass some voting, uh, some voting integrity measures. Things like you have to provide ID for mail-in ballots. They're not gonna send universal mail-in ballots out to people who haven't asked for them and just straightforward election procedures. Nothing that's racist, nothing that's evil or bad, despite all the things the Democrats say. And they say a lot about this, including that it is Jim Crow 2.0. More than 50 Democratic members have, of the Texas House uh, have left Texas uh, to stop Republicans from passing the latest iteration of their voter suppression legislation. And I'm up here because I don't plan to be a sitting person in that legislature. I'm not going to be a sitting. You ain't no sitting duck. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be a hostage. We are not going to stop. We are always going to push back against these sort of bigoted, racist, Jim Crow 2.0 style voting laws whenever you decide to bring them up. Yes, Jim Crow 2.0, not sending out ballots to people in the mail who never requested them. That's the kind of thing that gets Democrats making a direct comparison here to the Jim Crow era in this country. It's astoundingly inaccurate, indefensibly uh, untrue, and yet they think that they politically benefit from this. In fact, no less than Joe Biden himself today addressed this. Here's what he said. I've said it before. We're facing the most significant test of our democracy since the Civil War. That's not hyperbole. Since the Civil War. The Confederates back then never breached the Capitol as insurrectionists did on January the 6th. I'm not saying this to alarm you. I'm saying this because you should be alarmed. Isn't it, isn't it fascinating? It's not, it's not hyperbole. It is hyperbole. He's not saying it to alarm you. He is saying it to alarm you. I mean, Joe Biden can't help but be full of crap all the time. That's just what he does. That's just the nature of who he's been his entire adult life as a slimy Democrat machine politician who just happened to be the nearest warm body in the Democrat hierarchy that they thought they could push into the Oval Office through pretending that Donald Trump created COVID and was some monster worse than Hitler for four years. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, you think uh, people may have second thoughts about now. What does that do to our democracy? What does that do to this country when there's so many lies being told about President Trump and such an absurdity in the office right now uh, of jo with Joe Biden? But he's not the only one. Senator Chuck Schumer trying to tell you that it's it not so. So you have Biden saying it's the worst thing since the Civil War and comparing unarmed protesters guilty of trespass and assault on a police officer at the very worst, by the way. That's the worst crime, assault against a police officer. 
and which Democrats do all the time. I mean, BLM thinks assault against a police officer is how you build credibility, you know, as part of the riots and the movements that are out in the streets. And yet here we have Joe Biden telling everybody that what happened on January 6th was as much of a threat in some way as the actual civil war and the Confederates. I mean, this is crazy. But even Chuck Schumer is out there saying they're, they're doing this so they can steal an election. Across the country, Republican-controlled state legislatures are conducting the most sweeping and coordinated attack on voting rights in generations, fueled by Donald Trump's insidious big lie that the election was stolen. In several states, limits have been placed on voting hours, polling locations, and methods of voting. Barriers have been raised to make voting by mail, absentee voting, and after-hours voting, and early voting harder. Republican legislatures are not only making it harder to vote, they're making it easier to steal an election. Actually believe that. Easier to steal an election. Wait, hold on. Democrats are the ones who always want it to be easier to steal an election. That's why they don't want any voter, voter integrity measures. So now, now the Republicans are guilty of that too. What are the Republicans not guilty of at this point? I mean, Chuck Schumer's just making it up as he goes along, as he always does. But this talking point that this is the biggest challenge to our democracy since the Civil War uh, is not just something you hear from Joe Biden. It's from uh, the White House press secretary, too. Almost like this is the strategic messaging decision they've made. Go as crazy and over the top on this point as you possibly can. Here's Jen Psaki. He'll also decry efforts to strip the right to vote as authoritarian and anti-American uh, as a, uh, and stand up against the notion that politicians should be allowed to choose their voters or to subvert our system by replacing independent election authorities with partisan ones. And he will highlight the work of the administration against this, the necessity of passing the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and how we need to work together with civil rights organizations to build as broad a turnout and voter education system to overcome the worst challenge to our democracy since the Civil War. The worst challenge to our democracy since the Civil War. They all say it. It's not true. It's crazy. But they say it anyway. I mean, I'm pretty sure that World War II, the Nazis, the internment of Japanese Americans. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of things you could point to that are a bigger challenge to our democracy than a few hundred people who break into the Capitol and take selfies. But we're led to believe, no, this is basic. We, we were just hours away or minutes away from our entire system of government collapsing to the unarmed protesters who were uh, arrested and escorted off the premises by Capitol Hill police. Right. All right, we'll have more on this Democratic crusade against voter integrity laws with human events Jack Posobiec after the break. But first, let's talk about our newest sponsor, My Digital Money. Seems like everyone wants to invest in cryptocurrencies these days, but it's not that easy to get started. That's why Colin Plume, the CEO of Noble Gold, decided to create My Digital Money. It's an easy to use self trading crypto IRA platform with concierge level customer service. It's one of the few US based cryptocurrency companies that'll answer your phone call and help you get started. And because your comfort and security is their absolute top priority, they offer an unparalleled military-grade security for your coins, trigger orders to help you secure opportunities for gains or limit losses without having to watch your account 24-7, a play money account so you can test the market without risking your money, and with the recent pullback of most of the major cryptocurrencies, this might be the best time to get into this exciting technology-based investment. When it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals that have your back, speak to you honestly, and treat you like a human, not just a number. Check out MyDigitalMoney.com. That's MyDigitalMoney.com. We'll be right back. As we reported, Texas Democrats are in Washington, D.C. today after abandoning the state in order to prevent the passage of a new voting reform bill. Yesterday, more than 50 Democratic members of the Texas State House boarded private planes bound for the nation's capital, D.C., where they plan to stay for weeks, they say, if necessary. The move effectively prevents Republicans from taking up the bill by denying the quorum required to pass new legislation. In response, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is threatening to have the legislators arrested upon their return to the Lone Star State. I can and I will continue to call special session after special session after special session all the way up until election next year. And so if these people want to be hanging out wherever they're hanging out on this taxpayer paid junket, they're going to have to be prepared to do it for well over a year. 
As soon as they come back into the state of Texas, they will be arrested. They will be cabined inside the Texas Capitol until they get their job done. Seems the question is, will Governor Abbott hold the line? For more, let me turn to senior editor at Human Events, Jack Posobiec. Agent Poso, good to see you, sir. Commodore Sexton, how are you, my friend? I'm all right. I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a man who, when you hear a, a guy in Texas say, we will arrest you when you enter our state, I generally take that seriously. You, you think that he's going to actually manage to hold the line on this one? Well, I think there's something very interesting going on with this political stunt, which is actually a completely illegal act of these Texas Democrats saying that they are going to effectively derail the Texas legislative session. Now, for people who don't understand how state government works, Texas is a little different. They meet for select sessions on, I believe it's a two year cycle to pass legislation like this. Now, by them leaving, it, it, it uh, robs Texas of having a quorum, which is actually not in line to violation of the Texas state constitution, one that they swore to uphold when they took office. So. Here's something that's an interesting way to look at this situation that I don't think anyone's talking about. And you've, you've seen some people uh, ask who paid for these flights and then other people saying, well, we need this law. But let's let's go back a second here. Weren't we told that January 6 was an insurrection because January 6 disrupted a democratic process? Well, something that I'd like to put to you that I don't think anyone else has pointed out yet. Is this not the disruption of a legal process in the state of Texas? and a usurpation of the Texas government's duly elected duty to conduct their business for the affairs of their representatives. And as such, is it no less an insurrection by these members? And so Governor Abbott, that is what he is basing this legal opinion on. They are willfully and deliberately disrupting the legislative session of Texas. And that is why he is calling for their lawful arrest when they return. Jack, it is in fact illegal what's going on. I think people haven't seen that said nearly enough in the media. What these Democrats have done is a violation of Texas law, which is why, of course, they can be arrested and brought to the Capitol to do their jobs. And, and this has been pointed out. I think it's also the case that the governor of Texas, Abbott, could call for special elections to replace these members because they've effectively, legally speaking, abandoned their posts. So there's a lot of things that are going on here. But they think of themselves as heroes. James Tallarico, who is a Texas state rep, tweeted this out. This was pretty hilarious. I'm sure you saw this. Just landed in Memphis on our way to D.C. Thank you all for your well wishes. We left behind our families, our livelihoods, and our beloved Texas, but our sacrifice is nothing compared to the sacrifices brave Americans have made throughout history to protect the sacred right to vote. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say to this guy, I'm glad he doesn't quite think that he's storming the beaches of Normandy, but he kind of thinks he's doing something brave by going to D.C., yeah, James Tallarico, I actually, I don't know if you saw, but he watched, I watched a few videos of him and he's one of these new generation of young Democrats who like Pete Buttigieg, like uh, Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania, or uh, like uh, John Ossoff down in Georgia. They're, they're really young, but they, they use that sort of uh, highly affected voice where they, uh, Beto does this as well down in Texas, where they drop their voice down to register when they speak. So, so, so they come across with a gruffer kind of tone, a deeper voice that is clearly and obviously not their true voice, but they use it every time they speak. <laughs> Pretty good post. So we got a radio career for you if you want it. Um, what do we think? My dad always said I had a face for radio. Uh, what do we think this ends up turning into, though? And, and why do you think the Democrats are pulling these shenanigans right now? Look, what it comes down to it, the Democrats know they have a problem. They are scared to death of anybody cracking open the books on the 2020 election. And they know that they have been called out. They look. There's two sides of this debate, and over the past 20 years, there have always been. One side pushes for actual, fair, and secure elections. We want to know who's voting, we want to know when they're voting, and we want to make sure that they're voting properly. That's it. The other side fights against those. They fight against voter ID. They fight to open up these universal mail-in ballots. They vote to have these uh, ballot boxes. I'm not just talking Texas, I'm talking nationwide. They want to have ballot boxes that people can drop off stuff in the dead of night. They're not monitored. Nobody knows what's going on these, with these things. One side argues for secure elections that are high integrity. 
The other side argues for unsecure, low integrity elections. And the problem is that when you have low integrity elections, that's what causes mistrust and deep seated resentment of those telling you that you can't have higher integrity. If this was happening in the military or the intelligence community where you and I worked, this would not fly. If this was happening in the private sector and they said, no, you can't audit our financials, you might go to jail, right? <laughs> if you have a public company and they say, well, we want to audit your books. No, you can't do that. All right, that's that's a you know, that's an arrestable offense. Jack. So what's going on here is they want to shut down all accountability when it comes to elections. Jack, I wanted to just get your take before we uh, let you go on the status of the Democrat insurrection narrative. I've seen that there's going to be some additional tech maybe used by Capitol Hill police to surveil citizens uh, to make sure they can uh, keep the next insurrection. You know, the fencing has come down, but they say they're going to keep the next insurrection from happening. What's going on with this? I mean, when are we going to actually get to see the charges? When are we going to find out who shot Ashley Babbitt? It feels like there's a lot that's not yet known. Well, what's incredible to me is that we've again come to a solution without a problem. We have not yet seen any of these defendants prosecuted for treason, for sedition, for an actual insurrection, right? We've seen trespassing, we've seen disruptions, and, and certainly we don't argue that any of those things took place. And yet law enforcement, when it comes to the FBI and the DOJ's response to this, they are talking about going after social media, they are talking about monitoring text messages, they're talking about going into your Telegram channels, your Discord channels, they are going anywhere communications are found because they want to inc ever increase their wider net of going after what they perceive as domestic enemies. And they're talking about people who have basic questions, like I just alluded to, about the integrity of our elections and quite uh, quite more broadly, what is actually going on in this country when it comes to those in power, both in government and out of government, who seem to be wielding more and more control over our daily lives. Jack, good to see you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. Thanks so much, Buck. Always a pleasure. There's a relative calm in Cuba today after a weekend of demonstrations against the nation's ruling communist regime. While many voiced their support for the dissidents in the streets, a lot of Democrats seemed unmoved by the protests. Coming up here, the First TV's Morgan Ziegers gives her thoughts on the left's failure to offer a full-throated support of demonstrators. But first, let's talk about your investments. If you ever thought about investing in real estate, I want you to take me up on this recommendation right now. Visit doneforyoubuck.com where you can learn more about my friends at Done For Your Real Estate. If you haven't checked them out yet, let me make this easy for you. These guys have found a way to make real estate investing straightforward and their system flat out works. I know because I'm using it. It allows everyday hardworking Americans like you and me to finally own investment real estate without all the risk and difficulty of doing it on your own. I can't possibly tell you in strong enough terms during this 60 second commercial how important it is that you check these guys out. So how about this? If you visit doneforyoubuck.com, at the top of the page is a podcast interview I did with Done For You Real Estate, where you can hear my personal experience with their company in my own words. I'll tell you about it in detail, picking the city, the house, getting the broker, the loan, even getting a tenant in place so I get cash flow coming to me every month. Visit doneforyoubuck.com, listen to the podcast interview, and give my friends a chance to show you what they can do for you. We'll be right back with more Hold The Line. The streets are reportedly somewhat quiet today after a weekend of unprecedented protests against Cuba's uh, communist regime. Of course, there's no way to be sure of what's happening right now as internet access has been curtailed throughout the island nation. While the demonstrations found widespread support here in the U.S., many Democrats appear hesitant to throw in their lot with the Cuban dissidents. After more than a day of silence on the issue, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders finally offered a comment giving the obligatory call for peace and then, of course, blaming the U.S. for the misery of the Cuban people. Last night, Sanders, socialist Sanders, tweeted, All people have the right to protest and live in a democratic society. I call on the Cuban government to respect opposition rights and refrain from violence. It's also long past time to end the unilateral U.S. embargo on Cuba, which has only hurt and not helped the Cuban people. Other Democratic politicians, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and several other members of the squad, have chosen to remain silent. So why is it so difficult for Democrats to unequivocally support Cuban protesters? Morgan Zegers is the founder of Young Americans Against Socialism and a First TV contributor. She's with us now. Morgan, good to see you. 
Thanks for having me on, Buck. This is a very important topic, so I'm glad to be talking about it. Yes, you were the, as we said, you were somebody who has been involved in the fight against socialism and particularly young people having misperceptions of socialism early on is one of the reasons that we don't see a more full-throated, all-out condemnation of the Cuban regime because the media has some sympathy for the commies in Cuba. Absolutely. And it's not just some sympathy, it's straight up propaganda. I don't know if you saw my recent tweet, but I was shocked when I opened up Twitter when this all first started happening a few days ago. And the top trend on my trending list on my Twitter.com desktop was that Cuba was protesting and rioting because they didn't have access to vaccinations that they wanted for COVID-19. And okay, that makes sense. They're frustrated they don't have COVID vaccinations. But the problem is that the media isn't saying because it's a communist regime that's been deteriorating for decades, they're just pushing that COVID narrative that they want to control. And so for me, I see that as propaganda that we've seen over the last few years. My focus though, and then I, I the focus I think we all need to be taking on this, is understanding that the same messaging that we've approached this issue with for decades has been the reason why now so many young Americans are confused about socialism, communism, Marxism, and are being used as useful idiots. And so we really need to work over the next week or so to make sure our messaging on this is solid, to connect the failures and the deterioration of this society and its inability to solve the COVID-19 pandemic properly to its origins when socialists many decades ago in the 50s and 60s promised to bring utopian uh, solutions to the country that were never going to come to fruition. And we've certainly seen in recent years the polling show that particularly younger Americans, people under the age of 30, and particularly those 18 to 22 or so, uh, have a positive view of socialism, which you would think certainly on social media and, and in some of the uh, younger news outlets out there, younger, I mean, really in terms of the platform and their, their prospective audience, uh, they don't seem to have, I mean, when you compare the rage that Democrats will show and leftists will show toward whether it's Brett Kavanaugh or climate change deniers or whatever. Uh, I hate that term climate change denier, but that's what they say. It's an idiotic term. But they get angry at those people. The oppressive, tyrannical, murdering, anti-human rights uh, Cuban regime, they feel like, well, let's just let's let the protest play out. That's all we hear. Let's have solidarity with the right of the people to protest. What's up with that? Exactly. And so people looking at AOC and Bernie and expecting them to all of a sudden flip a switch and say, we must stand with the people of Cuba against their evil dictatorial communist regime. That's a little naive. I mean, they are pretty communist. And so they're very authoritarian. They are true leftists. For decades, they've been praising this regime. So they're not going to turn their back on it now. They believe in this style of leadership. And so I'll remind you, Buck, Fidel Castro came to power and rejected the term socialist and communist. He said, I am not a communist. This is not a communist nation. I am not a Marxist. I am a democratic humanitarian, is what he called himself. Does that sound familiar? Considering the weird fluffy language that we hear from the radical leftists in America today. So this is a tale as old as time. And what I always think of, you know, the, the numbers are crazy, like you said. 70%, according to a YouGov poll of young Americans, would vote for a socialist. And that was back in 2019. So imagine how weird things have gotten since then. On top of that, multiple Gallup polls over the years have shown that a majority of young Americans would choose socialism over capitalism. And so you see these numbers and it's a little freaky at first. A lot of people say it's the participation trophies that we've had passing down to our kids as they grow up. I would say one of the main reasons is that in the school system, when we learn about the 20th century and the history there, we learn about Stalin, we learn about Lenin and Castro, and we learn about Mao Zedong, and we learn about the massive numbers of deaths. But those deaths and what happened in those regimes and those bad guys are not connected to the fact that they came to power promising some really nice things. They came to power promising a more moral, more just, more equitable society. And then, well, once you start implementing their economic policies the same way the, same way the left promises they'll do when they get in power, things start to get a little bad. And so it's understanding and connecting those dots for young minds that I think is gonna be so important. And so, like I said, the messaging that we take on over the next week and over the next month as we see what happens with Cuba is gonna be so important because it's just such an important opportunity for us. The way that with COVID-19 happened with communist China was a really great way for us to reach young minds and educate them about the fact that this regime has a terrible history. It's the same regime from the Tiananmen Square massacre, from the one child policy and so on and so on. Uh, and so it's really onto us to connect those dots in young minds. Do you think that 
The silence or relative silence from the squad, AOC, Ilhan Omar, young members of Congress who are the, perhaps the most visible far left members of Congress. Of course, there's Bernie Sanders in the Senate as well. Uh, do, do you think that they'll start to feel like they have to say more about this? Or is it just the ignorance, particularly of, of college age leftists and those in their 20s is such that it doesn't matter what comes out? Because, for example, what we're going to see is the Cuban regime is engaged in vicious repression. I mean, they're, they're imprisoning people, they're, abu they're you know, attacking, abusing, torturing political dissidents. That's all happening right now. We can be assured of that. As some of that comes out, do you just expect silence from the squad? I do expect silence. So there's two things on this for this question. Yes, I expect silence from the squad because they truly believe in these values. I mean, they're endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America. The Democratic Socialists of America just met in Venezuela with Nicolas Maduro, the dictator there. Uh, on top of that, they claim that they do want to end capitalism, private business, private property, and slowly transition America into a worker-owned economy. You know what that means. I'm sure everybody with a common sense mind understands what that means. It's when the government takes over and says they're controlling things in the name of the people. And so I think that the radicals in power, they are the true leftists. And Buck, I like to call them the flat earthers of economics because they've seen what's happened throughout history and they say, I think I'm gonna do it right this time. I think we can still make it happen. My focus, and I think our focus on this should be the very naive, misguided, and lied to liberals. So there's a big difference between the radical leftists that are ideological, that are in power, that are manipulating and lying and pushing propaganda, and the very naive and misled young people that do want justice. And so I think with the silence of the radical left, with the silence of the squad, usually they're the ones so vocal for justice. I wonder how we're gonna see this play out. I keep thinking that the more the young people in America see the dots connected, the more they see the hypocrisy of the radical left, they're going to start to open their eyes and say, whoa, 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 I don't embrace socialism, actual, you know, elimination of private business, including small family businesses. I don't support authoritarianism and the removal of free speech, totalitarianism, any of those aspects. I'm just a liberal who, you know, leans a little left, but I still believe in the basic foundations of our country. So I think we're, we're seeing the play out right now of, of very woke liberals and radical leftists, and we will be able to win those well-intentioned liberals over to our side the more the radical left goes crazy. At the same time, though, there is the risk of them being continually used as useful idiots. And we've seen what history does with that. It's very dangerous. Morgan, you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for your perspective on this. And please go, go teach some uh, history to Gen Z. They need some help. We're trying. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Buck. The CDC recently announced it was revising its guidance for school children, relaxing mass recommendations, and recommending a full return to in-person learning in the fall. So why are Democrats still pushing for strict mask mandates and social distancing? New York Post columnist Carol Markowitz will help answer that question when we return. But first, I want to talk to you about my friends at Black Rifle Coffee. I mean, if you're like me, you got to kick off your morning with a dose of caffeine. And that means some delicious Black Rifle Coffee. Not only is it some of the best coffee I've ever tasted, this is a veteran-owned company that serves premium coffee to people who love America. Black Rifle Coffee is continually committed to supporting veteran law enforcement and first responder causes. This summer, Black Rifle invites you to enjoy your coffee. Not just the great taste, but also the places you drink it, the passion and adventure it infuels and inspires, and the entertainment that Black Rifle is going to serve along the way. Whether you're brewing the perfect cup of pour over before kicking ass at work or cracking a can of 300 on your next backcountry mission, Black Rifle Coffee is here to fuel your way wherever the summer takes you. Black Rifle imports its high quality coffee beans from all over the world and roasts them five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee and Salt Lake City, Utah. The team at Black Rifle Coffee is continually researching and experimenting with new roasting methods and coffee origins. Purchase at blackriflecoffee.com slash buck and use code buck at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Fuel your summer with America's coffee. We'll be right back. The CDC announced its revised plan allowing all vaccinated children the option to wear a mask in the classroom, but unfortunately, New York City students won't have that luxury. Mayor Bill de Blasio claims he wants to keep students safe from harm by upholding all mask requirements. According to the New York Post, all New York City public school students must continue to wear masks in the classroom, Mayor Bill de Blasio said on Monday, despite the CDC's latest guidance that vaccinated kids and teachers can go mask-free. 
For now, we're sticking with the idea that wearing the masks is a smart thing to do in schools, de Blasio said during his morning press briefing. We'll keep assessing as we go along, but for now, it still makes sense. Well, this isn't just happening in New York City. Frustrated parents in places all over the country, like in California, feel they have no choice but to sue their local school district in order to have these unnecessary mask mandates lifted when crazy Democrats happen to keep them in place, usually in large cities. Joining us to give her perspective, New York Post columnist Carol Markowitz, who has been on this all along. Carol, good to see you. Hi, Buck. Thank you. We're not done, are we? I mean, de Blasio in New York, and it's not just going to be New York. Kids are going to all be wearing masks this fall, just like you and I have been saying. Yeah. You know, my kids haven't worn a mask since the last day of school. They've been in camp every day, and they're running free all over the city and not wearing a mask. Um, And just the idea of in September to have to go back to it for no reason at all, for no scientific reason whatsoever, it's really galling. And it's really frustrating. And I feel so bad for these kids. Um, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. I, you know, we've discussed before that. Uh, the free state of Florida beckons us, um, and, and we definitely think about it a lot. Uh, but it, it's hard. It's hard to just uproot our lives and uh, make a change like this because everything uh, in New York has gone so bad. Carol, what do you think is pushing it? I mean, wh- how can we be at this point where de Blasio is essentially saying, yeah, I know what the CDC guidance is for yeah. these vaccinated kids, mm-hmm. but I don't really care. And, and, and it seems like right. Democrats are like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I you know, it, it's absolutely being pushed from the teachers union. Um, it's keeping keeping people extra, extra, extra safe. Uh, and I think we've gotten to where we just can't manage risk at all anymore. And because they can't enforce these kinds of guidelines on vaccinated grownups, um, they they know the kids aren't vaccinated. And so they can continue to push their ridiculous policies on them. It's really unfortunate because kids should have never been wearing masks. I mean, in Europe, in most places, they were not wearing masks under 12. So like, and when they have like a big outbreak, they'd be like, okay, well now we have to start wearing masks in the hallway at school, but still not in class because that would be crazy. Um, And yet in America, we mask at two years old and every time you see a toddler being dragged off a plane, it's happening in America. You know, the Biden administration, Carol, isn't backing down when it comes to their vaccine agenda. They're taking it as far as having volunteers coming to your doorstep with a pamphlet Uh, and giving you their opinion, of course. Here's what the president and his press secretary had to say. Now we need to go to community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and oftentimes door to door, literally knocking on doors to get help to the remaining people protected from the virus. One, uh, targeted community by community door to door outreach to get remaining Americans vaccinated by ensuring they have the information they need on how both safe and accessible the vaccine is. Have we had any evidence whatsoever that there are substantial numbers of people in America who don't know about the vaccine? I mean, I'm just what I, I don't right. actually think it would be possible to live in the United States today and not know yeah. there's a covid vaccine that is free and available all over the place. So what I mean, right. they act like it's an information campaign meant to just tell people something they don't know. But no, I mean, this is really a nagging campaign because there are people yeah. that just don't want to get the vaccine. Well, Kamala Harris uh, the other day said that rural Americans don't know where to make a photocopy. So I think there's a lot that they think Americans don't know. Um, I don't understand why the conversation remains like this. Like, to me, if we want to urge people to get vaccinated, it wouldn't be um, this kind of hysterical, we must go find you door to door. It would be just continue to present the facts of vaccinations. Um, continue to present that you might get sick from COVID-19 or, you know, you're taking a chance. And if you want to get vaccinated, do it. But the thing is that those of us who are vaccinated, um, I'm vaccinated, you know, I, I, I'm absolutely for it. Um, I think that the idea is why do we care if people are not vaccinated? I really don't care if other people don't choose not to become, not to get vaccinated. It's not my problem. It's their problem. And I think that the faster we get to the place where we see people making the decision for themselves, the better. And the more we say we don't really care because we're vaccinated and we're safe, the more it shows that we trust the vaccine, not this crazy, we must get every single person vaccinated and go door to door and find them. Because well, that, that yeah, that's the part of this that, that really doesn't make work. any sense, Carol. Just, I mean, they, people who are vaccinated, you're, we, we all should assume, believe the vaccine works, hence why they got right. vaccinated. Right. And yet they seem to think that it's not effective enough 
that yes. everybody that unless every other human being in America is vaccinated, they're right. not protected sufficiently. That's not the way this is supposed to work. Yeah, it's crazy because I, I think that the conversation around vaccines has been so wrong the whole time because of this. It makes it seem like the vaccine is not effective and don't don't be in any rush to get it. And so I don't see why that message would resonate with people, even if you do take it door to door. And the thing about kids going back to that is they don't really need the vaccine. Kids are basically at, not at risk from COVID-19. And they, we need to hear that over and over again because people are so afraid and they so aren't letting their kids live their lives, um, even though this is basically not a risk to them at all. And I, look, I'm, I've always been very, very pro-vaccine. Like I said, I got vaccinated, but I'm not in no rush to get my kids the vaccine. They don't need it yet. I gotta say, uh, there's also um, a pretty clear, I think, growing call from, from uh, some of the lockdown leftists to start to use the coercive powers of the private sector with the government egging them on, so to speak. I mean, here's the former director of Planned Parenthood, Lena Wynn on CNN, oh, yeah. telling everybody, we're gonna make your lives miserable unless you get vaccinated. What we really need to do at this point is to make vaccination the easy choice. It needs to be hard for people to remain unvaccinated. Right now, it's kind of the opposite. It's fine. I mean, it's easy if you're unvaccinated. You can do everything you want to do anyway. But at some point, these mandates by workplaces, by schools, I think it will be important to say, hey, you can opt out. But if you want to opt out, you have to sign these forms. You have to get twice weekly testing. Basically, we need to make getting vaccinated the easy choice. That is what it's going to take for us to actually end the pandemic. I think when it comes to somebody who, for a while at least, uh, whose life's work was to make sure that as many babies were aborted in America as, as possible, um, we have to take her seriously when she says she's willing to use destructive and coercive power uh, to get her way. Yeah. And this is not the first time that she's said something like this, really scary authoritarian kind of stuff like this. Um, she said that basically if we don't continue to have lockdowns well into the vaccination process, then um, people will have no, no reason to go get vaccinated. They won't be winning anything. They won't be getting access to things. Um, I think these you know, little authoritarians need to be off our TVs and we have to stop listening to them. I know that you know, there's a lot of sanity out there, but there's just a lot of people that really were scared by this virus, were scared by the messaging from the government um, and continue to live really fearful lives. And we need people like, like her to go away in order to let people go back to living their healthy, free lives again. Carol, always appreciate it. Good to see you. Buck, thanks so much. All right, coming up, more bad news on the economic front. And Facebook pushes a truly disturbing video on its users. Those stories are coming up in quick hits. But before we uh, take that moment of pause here, I want to tell you about our newest sponsor, My Digital Money. Everyone wants to invest in cryptocurrencies, but it's not that easy to get started. Well, that's why Colin Plume, the CEO of Noble Gold, decided to create My Digital Money. It's an easy to use self-trading crypto IRA platform with concierge level customer service. It's one of the few US-based cryptocurrency companies that will answer your phone call and help you get started. And because your comfort and security is their absolute top priority, they offer an unparalleled military grade security for your coins, trigger orders to help you secure opportunities for gains or limit losses without having to watch your account 24 seven and a play money account so you can test the market without risking your actual money. With the recent pullback of most of the major cryptocurrencies, this might be the best time to get into this exciting technology-based investment. And when it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals that have your back, speak to you honestly, and treat you like a human, not just a number. Check them out at mydigitalmoney.com. That's mydigitalmoney.com. We'll be right back with Quick Hits. Inflation continues to rise across the country, and Gavin Newsom, governor of California, makes a paperwork error that might cost him big time in the recall election. Those stories on Quick Hits. Let's get to it. Uh, but this one we didn't mention, but inflation, because that's a really important thing. That's going to make your dollars in your bank account that you're getting paid by your employer, perhaps. Uh, it's going to make it worth less to you. It's not a good thing. And U.S. consumers faced a third straight monthly surge in prices in June. A Labor Department report showed that consumer prices in June rose 0.9% for May and 5.4% over the past year. That's the sharpest 12-month inflation spike since June of 2008. So 
Yes, inflation is absolutely on the rise. This is a major challenge. This is something Democrats don't want you to focus on. They have other things they want you to be thinking about, you know, like the insurrection or Republicans preventing minorities from voting with voter ID, which is something that even minority voters by strong majority support in practice. So what the heck is that all about? And this is, a, this is something else. This was on Facebook. It's a video from a program called Nine Months with Courtney Cox. It shows a transgender couple pushing their newborn to breast, breastfeed from a biological male? What? Oh, I put it over here. The baby has been able to latch, but I've not been able to produce any milk. It's okay because we're gonna supplement the feeding with formula so that my baby's still getting the, the nutrients that they need, but I'm still feeling hopeful. I appreciate you so much for all your work. I appreciate you also, baby. What was that? My God. Anyway, that's, a, that's part of the, uh, I don't know. I don't even, I don't, honestly, I don't even know. Yes, the male breasts do not produce milk, and we all know that, but some people apparently don't. And, and what is a clear delusion, we could say that with, without any, any compunction, uh, we're supposed to all play along because rights or something. What right is this to pretend that, you know, I, I mean, I wish I, I wish I were seven feet tall, but if I walked around telling everybody I was seven feet tall, they would think something was wrong with me. They wouldn't say, oh, you are seven feet tall. Right. I mean, only Jesse Kelly is seven feet tall. You'll see him later on this channel. Uh, Gavin Newsom will not be listed as a Democrat on the recall ballot. He can't be listed as a Democrat, a judge said Tuesday. Newsom sued his Secretary of State last month to get his party affiliation on the ballot saying his election lawyer made a good faith mistake and failed to mark it on forms last year, but a California judge says he missed the deadline. Circumstances do not justify the late addition. So just another reason for good old Gavin to be a little concerned about how his recall situation is going to go, something we should all be aware of and be thinking about for sure. Um, and uh, hopefully he does, in fact, get recalled. That's what we would like to see. I would love to see Gavin Newsom get tossed. Although they'll just replace him with some other Democrat, that's for sure. California has, as a state, politically lost its mind. It's a shame. It's a beautiful place. I'd love to see it doing well. And then Stephen A. Smith, he's the highest paid ESPN commentator. He makes over $10 million, I think $12 million a year. So he's a big name over at ESPN. He said that uh, a Major League Baseball star, Shohei Otani, is doing a disservice to Major League Baseball. Well, here's what, because he doesn't speak uh, English and that's an issue for his marketability. He's making sports commentary, cause a huge problem. Here's what he said now. After I don't think it helps that the number one face is a dude that needs an interpreter so you can understand what well, the hell he's English saying a, in this helpful. country. And that's what I'm trying to say. I want to express my sincere apologies to the Asian community and the Asian American community. And the reality of the situation is that you have Asians and Asians Americans out there that obviously were very, very offended by what I had to say yesterday. And I just want to look into the camera and extend my sincere apologies. That was not my intent at all, but I'm not going to get into all of that because I do understand that a lot of racists out there are quick to say that was not my intent. That's not where I'm going here. Okay. Speaks for itself, I guess. That's it for tonight's Hold the Line. The No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly is up next. Shields high.